hello everyone. Thanks for coming to, to our talk here. Um, just briefly introduce myself. I'm Toki. I lead the solution architecture team uh, in the US for OpenAI, and I have Anoop here as well in the solution architecture team. Uh, and we'll talk about building practical audio agents. Um, before I jump in, maybe a quick raise of hands. Who has either like built an audio agent or voice agent of some kind or thinking about building an audio agent? OK, so like half-ish of the room. OK, good to know. It's always good to know where, what people's interests are. So yeah, we'll talk a bit about like, um, some of the things we've, we've learned, where audio models are today, and then some of the kind of patterns and best practices. So just to take a quick step back, um, Gen AI applications broadly to date, as many of you all know, have been very text-based, right? This is uh, models that really deeply understand uh, and generate text with very much human-like fluency. And there's a lot of production applications out there built on text. And that continues to scale. I think we've really started to enter a bit more of this multimodal era, where we now have models that can understand images extremely well. There's now models that can generate images really well. If you were part of the image gen Studio Ghibli craze, uh, or Sora that generates videos, for example. Um, and then now also audio. These are models. We've had models like transcription models or text-to-speech models for some time. But now this kind of emerging speech-to-speech -speech capability is getting a lot better. And I would say now we, we will see, I think, a much more of an explosion of use cases around these modalities of images and video. And today we're really going to focus on the audio modality uh, across this. So I, I would say like one important thing we're starting to see is that audio is really getting to that point where it's becoming much more usable at scale. And again, we've had the transcription and the TTS side, but especially that speech-to-speech -speech low latency experience, the models are getting, I would say, good enough and are kind of at this tipping point where you can start to really meaningfully build high quality production applications at scale. So I'd say before the models were a lot slower, robotic, and brittle, and, and now they're a lot faster, expressive, and accurate. I'll show an example. The first one will show what the models were like not even six months ago. It's a very painful example, so I hope you feel a bit of the pain uh, in this. Hello. Hello, please give me a topic for your haiku. Uh You can see the, the initial delay. Um, that's actually honestly. Uh, could you write me a haiku about whispers? Me. Silent air, actually, faint could words, you whispers drift through darkened about rooms. Stars? Secrets linger near. Dust slides through my hands. Sifted grains forget the weight. What is left behind? So I hope you felt the pain a little bit, right? So these models are, uh, this is actually not just, not even six months ago, right? The models are incredibly slow. Um, they're very robotic in how they sound, uh, and they're quite brittle. So in that example, we actually tried to interrupt the model and tell it, no, don't write a, don't write a poem about uh, whispers, write one about stars, and wrote one about sand. I'm not sure where it got that from. So just showing you that's actually where it was. And then now if you like fast forward to today, these are the models that, uh, for a very similar use case, kind of how they, how they'll behave today. Hello. Greetings. Share with me a topic, and I shall weave a haiku for you, rich with emotion and imagery. What shall it be? Can you make a haiku about whispers? Whispers? Actually, could you make a haiku about stars? Stars, whispers of light, adorning the velvet night, eternal secrets. So you can see it's much faster, it's incredibly expressive, emotional, you can steer it, you can get it excited, you can slow it down, and it's accurate. We interrupted it, we had it change course and do something else, and it responded well. Um, so the models are really, we do believe, at that good enough tipping point where you can start to build much more reliable experiences around it. Um, in terms of actually building on top of the uh, audio models, there's really two emerging architectures that we see. One is kind of the one that's been around for a bit, and then I'd say a little bit of the newer one, which I'll talk about. The existing one has been what we call kind of the chained approach. This is stitching together these three approaches. You have audio come in, you transcribe it, you have some sort of intelligence layer with an LLM that does some sort of intelligence, and then finally text-to-speech on the output. Um, but again, this is stitching together three models. There's a lot of problems with this. It's slow across time. It takes longer time to actually generate your output audio. Um, it also has some lossiness across this, right? You kind of lose a little bit of the semantic understanding of the conversation. So really this emerging pattern is more the speech-to-speech -speech architecture where it really it takes these three models into a um, single model, which for us, it's the real-time API. 
Uh, and it does all these layers. It does the transcription, it does that intelligence layer, and then finally does the speech as the output. So this simplifies the architecture quite dramatically, really reduces the time it takes to output. This is really good for low latency experiences. Um, and it doesn't have that lostiness problem. You actually are able to maintain semantic understanding across a conversation. So this is really kind of the emerging pattern we see. And when building, there's some kind of key trade-offs and considerations to take into account um, when building on top of these architectures. And we think it's kind of across these five main areas. You have latency, you have cost, you have accuracy and intelligence, user experience, and integrations and tooling. And depending what you're building, your trade-offs will be different, right? So if, for example, you're talking about a consumer-facing application, um, the trade-offs are, are quite different. Here, you care a lot about user experience. Um, these are usually a low latency experience that um, a lot of end users are, are interacting with the model. So user experience matters a lot. Latency matters a lot. It can't be slow. It needs to be really fast and attractive. But things like cost probably doesn't matter as much. It doesn't need to be accurate. Not really, right? It's more about expressiveness and quick answers. Um, and integrations and tooling, like you don't really need to integrate with uh, SIP or like Twilio for, for a broader experience. It's a pretty simple um, uh, interaction. So things like this would really, the real-time API works really well for a consumer-facing application depending on these trade-offs. Now, if you go to customer service as another example, the trade-offs are different, right? So here, accuracy intelligence actually probably matters the most. You can't get an order number wrong. If it uh, goes to delete an order instead of updating an order, that's a big deal. So accuracy and intelligence matters probably the most. Integrations and tooling start to matter a lot more too because now you have to integrate with your various internal systems. You have to integrate with yeah, SIP and phone providers if needed. Um, so those are probably the most important things. But user experience still matters, but you'll probably take a hit on that a little bit to make sure it's more accurate. Again, latency still matters, but not as much because accuracy intelligence matters more and cost, um, you're saving a, a large cost for this anyway. So I think these are just the other considerations to, um, to take into account for customer service. So for this, real-time API might make sense for uh, a situation where latency might matter the most, but if you care about determinism and accuracy and intelligence, then actually the chained architecture would make a lot of sense here too. Um, but it's just important to consider what your trade-offs are depending on what you're trying to build. So hopefully that gives you a paints you a picture a bit of like what to consider. I'll hand it off to Noob to talk about very specific patterns we've seen when working with customers building on this. Cool. Awesome, Toki. Um, so me just like taking a step back, I think we've probably defined agent a bunch of times, but here's just like a kind of a canonical definition to hopefully keep everyone grounded for this session. Um, think of an agent as some model, some set of instructions, so your prompts, the tools you give your model, and then the runtime. So like the guardrails, like how you do your execution environment. Um, and generally, like when you're building voice agents, that's all the same things you should be worrying about. But there's also a few other things that are maybe a bit different that we're going to focus on today. Uh, so the main stuff is like your system design is probably a bit different than a traditional LLM agent. Um, it's probably a bit different on the prompting side and customization of the voice. Um, the tools you're using, probably a bit different. Um, and then also evals and guardrails you might have to think about um, as well. So these are the things we'll, we'll probably focus on that are like distinct when you're building specifically voice agents compared to like traditional agents. Cool. So if you've all built uh, maybe like a text-based agent, let's use like customer service as a canonical example. Um, you have like some user question. You have some sort of triage agent that's like a small model that like goes to other models here that will do like the harder tasks. So you'll have like an O3 to do like the refund or maybe like an O4 mini to do some like cancellation. Um, and typically that's like how you build a, a normal agent today. Uh, for voice, one pattern that we're starting to see more and more of is some sort of like delegation through tools. So you would have like the real-time API be your like frontline agent. So it does a lot of the normal interaction patterns that you're used to. So it can respond to like the easy questions that you sort of want your model to answer. And you know you're confident in your model answering. Um, but then there's also other questions that might be a bit harder. Um, and then you want your model to like do a tool call to these other agents that are run by smarter models behind the hood. Um, so that's a, a pattern that we'll show a quick video of, of like how this would work. I've authenticated you now. What item would you like to return? Yeah, I want to return the snowboard I bought. Got it. I'm reviewing the policy and we'll get back to you with next steps shortly. So here's a scenario where we're actually using like a much smarter model, O4 Mini, uh, and delegating to that because we don't want uh, a smaller model. It like looks like the Mini return you are making is within the 30-day return policy. We will process the return and send you a confirmation email with next steps shortly. So that's like one pattern uh, we've seen on the architecture side. Another point I touched on is like the the way you 
basically customize your brand and what you're sort of building. Uh, so the prompts you're using is a huge part of that. And the way to think about this is when you're prompting models today uh, in the text-based world, you only can control like the instructions you're giving it and sort of what you want the model to do. But in voice-based applications, you can also control the expressiveness of the voice and how you want the model to speak or sound. Uh, so this is like an example prompt here of, hey, you can control like the demeanor, the tone, the level of enthusiasm, all of those things that don't really get captured in a, in a text agent that you do have much more control over in a voice-based agent. Um, here's just a, a fun website you can use to play around with this, openai.fm, um, where you can play around with different voices and also click through sample prompts that we've created. Uh, this is a, just a great place to get started on like actually playing around with the expressiveness of voices and seeing that there is a ceiling and like a lot of fluctuation you can get in performance just by the prompts that you do use. Uh, another side of this is when you're when you're prompting models in the the text-based approach, you probably have like a lot of few shot examples of like, hey, I want you to do these few steps uh, and then do these next few steps um, and go through like a, a typical uh, conversation flow. Uh, the same thing you can sort of mimic in voice. So if you see in in this picture, uh, there's like some idea of, hey, I want you to do some greeting, the description of it, and then the instructions for the users, um, and you can just go through that. So this is like a sample way of you to think through how you should be prompting models, especially for more complex tasks that you want the real-time API to handle. Uh, the next big bucket of things that are sort of important, or maybe like a bit different for the voice agency building is tools. Tool use in general is like very uh, important because you want your model to connect to other things that are sort of important for you. Um, and the first step is honestly just start simple. You don't need to connect 10 tools or like 20 tools to a given model. Uh, keep the number of tool calls pretty limited for a given agent. Uh, and that maybe goes back to the first diagram we, we showed of you want to delegate two different models or agents to do different tasks. So here, a given agent, don't give it a ton of tools to start with, and then slowly add on more tools as needed. Um, handoffs, so if you ever uh, use the agents SDK, this is a concept of if we have a given model, um, you want to pass it to another. Um, and here, you can manage context between handoffs as well. So the thing to remember here is you might have a given agent, and you're going to another one, but you want to keep the context the same between them. Um, so a good pattern to do is actually summarizing the conversation state and then passing it to the other agent so you don't lose any of the, the context and it's not lossy. Uh, the final one is delegation, so the concept we showed a bit earlier of like using O3 mini or O4 mini to do the tool call, that's like natively built into the agent's SDK if you'd like to try it out. Um, evals. So I think this is a pretty big part of the like voice experience and maybe like breaking it down into like four key buckets. I think the first and most obvious thing is always start with observability. Um, you're not going to get very far if you don't know how your data looks. Um, so just make sure you have traces of what's going on with your agents, uh, the audio and everything, so you can actually look at it and take actions. Um, and the next thing is when you're actually starting to do evals, like the most important thing is actually have SMEs to label these data um, and actually go and iterate on prompts from there. It sounds maybe a bit too easy, or it's like not the most appropriate or uh, maybe the best approach, but it is the most effective that we've seen when working with customers. Um, it lets you go a lot faster. Uh, and then from there, the next step is transcription-based evals. So this is where you would have your traditional um, as a judge evals or like testing your function calling performance on certain business criteria and having a rubric in place. Um, and then there's this next bucket. Uh, a lot of people ask us, how do we actually test the audio that's generated? Um, and for the most part, it's there's not a lot of things that audio uh, evals get you that maybe text evals don't. But the things that maybe it does get you is like understanding the tone, understanding the pacing, or other things that are maybe a bit harder to capture just through text. And this is where you can use like a completions model or some other audio model. Uh, so for example, GPT-4 audio to like understand the tone, the pacing, and what other intonations that you care about for your business. Um, and then the final one that we've started to see a bit more is actually synthetic conversations. So for example, maybe you have two real-time clients going back and forth across to each other. So maybe one is your real-time API agent or whatever, and then the other is a set of customer personas that you have. And you can s simulate like many, many of those conversations and then extract 
those evals across maybe like transcriptions or audio and then have a much better way to understand what you've sort of built. Cool. Uh, and then the final thing here is guardrails. Um, because especially for the real-time API, it's pretty fast. Uh, you want to have guardrails that make sure that you have the safety that's needed for, uh, to actually have confidence in, in the solution you're, you're rolling out to users. Um, so the main things we have here is like run them async, uh, generally because the generated text from the real-time API is much faster than the spoken audio that you get back from the model. So you have room to play with the latency here. Uh, the next thing also is you have control to set like whatever debounce period you have here. So in the code snippet, uh, to the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that like right now it runs every 100 characters to run the guardrails, but you can control that if you want to. Awesome. And then maybe just some learnings that we've seen from other folks in the field. Um, Lemonade, so uh, AI like insurance company, they're like building, e one of the things we like noticed from them that made them successful is they like focus really early on evals, guardrails, and like feedback mechanisms for their team. And even if it wasn't scalable, they realized that and it actually made them move a lot faster in the end. Um, and then finally for Tinder, um, they realized that customization and brand realism was pretty important for them when they were launching their Riz chat experience. Um, so that's what they focused on, and it created a much better experience for their users. And now I'll hand it off to Toki to cool. close us Yeah, up. just to wrap this all up, so I kind of, what I said in the beginning is we're really entering this multimodal era. So away from, or in addition to text-based models, we have now obviously um, video and image models, but now audio, so very much in that multimodal era. And this real-time speech-to-speech technology is emerging. And I think we had a kind of low-key update yesterday, our real-time API, we had a new snapshot that we, that we released that's actually a lot better. So I really feel like now is the time to, to build. So you kind of have this first mover's advantage to, to build now. I think the technology is getting to that point where it is good enough to build scalable production applications. Um, so really excited to see what you all build. Please test it out. Um, we'll be around after the talk if you guys have any questions, but thanks for the time.